We've talked about quite a few lunatics going on rampages and media circuses on this channel before, and I've had quite a lot to say about the consequences of both. But one aspect of such stories that we haven't really talked about before is how the public just eats all of it up. Sure, journalists are partial to trading their souls for a few extra morsels at the feeding frenzy, as we discussed in some depth during the Gladbeck video, but I can't deny that they wouldn't be such a problem if the public didn't create such huge demand. So, today we are going to talk about some random nerd well from Newcastle who snapped in such a spectacular fashion that for a whole week, he brought the entire country to a standstill. And he actually had police everywhere too scared to go outside. Raoul Moat. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is brought to you by Displate. With millions of officially licensed artworks to choose from, Displate definitely has something for you, ranging from your favourite games, movies and sports teams. Displate has a high quality metal print for everyone, with all kinds of franchises covered, including several of my personal favourites such as Alien, Dark Souls and Cowboy Bebop. With Displate, starting a wall of high quality art of the things you're a fan of is extremely easy. And putting your display on the wall couldn't be easier. All you have to do is stick the magnet to the wall and let magic or science or whatever do the work. If you want to check out more of my personal favourite displays, then click the link down in the description. And if you click the link, you won't only be supporting my channel, but you will also get an automatic discount of 23% off of 1 to 2 displays or 33% off of 3 or more displays. You will also be helping the planet by planting a tree for every displate you buy. Isn't that just lovely? This offer is only available for a limited time, so make sure you get in there fast. The best way that I can sum up Raoul Moat as a person is that he filled the Mad Lad bingo card. His early life was very troubled because he never knew his father, and his bipolar mother was frequently in and out of the loony bin, which meant that Moat and his brother ended up being raised by their grandmother. Moat himself also tried to get psychiatric help once, but soon enough you'll be able to see how that turned out. And if you're about to go down to the comments and say that three checked boxes in the intro doesn't exactly fill the card, or oh, don't worry, we'll get to the rest. As an adult, Moat crossed off another good chunk of the bingo card by becoming a 6 foot 3, 17 stone bodybuilder and a very avid user of steroids. And he made a living as a bouncer until, according to his best friend, he quit because he believed he was being unfairly harassed by the police. Moat already felt that throughout his entire life, the police were out to get him, constantly on his case and arresting him for even the tiniest thing since he was a child. This, of course, raised Moat to have an absolute seething hatred of police officers, which was a huge driving force behind actions of his that we will discuss later. Since he was built like a solid oak, it only seemed appropriate for Moat to then set up a tree surgery business called Mr. Trimmit. By the time 2010 rolled around, the 37-year-old Moat was in a six-year relationship with a girlfriend who was 15 years younger than him, and her name was Samantha Staubert. At best, the relationship could be described as a very on-and-off-again kind of deal, because the couple ultimately wanted different things. Samantha wanted to not be with a brutally paranoid and abusive narcissist, and Moat didn't want to stop being a brutally paranoid and abusive narcissist. So, you could say they were very often at an impasse with that type of thing. 
I will spare you the details of some of the abuse because they are quite grim, but Moat was so up his own arse that he reportedly flexed by keeping piranhas and a python as pets, as well as keeping a large shirtless picture of himself above the fireplace. As you would expect from a brick shithouse with a glass ego and roid rage, Moat did not handle anything that he saw as a blow to his ego particularly well. Having once sent graphic letters to an ex-girlfriend saying that he was planning to beat someone that he'd fallen out with with a baseball bat. Moat's temper actually very often took him beyond mere threats, which got him arrested 12 times and hit with 7 charges, one of which was possession of an offensive weapon. Which shouldn't in itself be a crime, but hey ho, welcome to Britain. The weapon in question was a knuckle duster that the cops had found in his car. Moat tried to defend himself against this charge by saying that he never intended to use it as a weapon because, and I quote, My hand barely fits through it. It is an ornamental item. I wouldn't like to hit someone with this. I'm a big lad. And I would have thought that if I punched someone with this, it would take the skin off my knuckles right down to the bone. The courts, however, were not buying it. Now, I think that's enough background on the kind of character that we're dealing with here, so let's get to the meat and potatoes of the story, which all began with Moat serving an 18-week sentence in Durham Prison for assault. Because, of course. However, that's not the inciting incident that began Moat's rampage. What really rustled Moat's jimmies was the fact that his girlfriend Samantha used Moat being in prison as an opportunity to escape with their daughter and get the fuck out of there while Moat wasn't around to stop her. She then started dating a karate instructor named Chris Brown. He must have been really good at punching. But while she was very happy in her new relationship, Samantha was still very worried about her psycho ex-boyfriend doing something to her new boyfriend. So, to scare Raoul Moat off, she claimed that Brown was a police officer, in the hope that spreading that little rumour would keep Moat away from her and deter him from doing something silly. Unfortunately, it did not work. Because Moat was a man who already had a deep, searing hatred for police officers. And now, a police officer was fucking his girlfriend. So, instead of keeping him away, this rumour ended up being the spark that set off a whole chain reaction. It's funny how much little white lies can get out of hand, isn't it? Moat was still in prison when he heard about his girlfriend running off with a cop. So, Moat, with absolutely nothing to lose, hatched a plan to get his own back. And, being the raging narcissist that he was, he actually told a fellow inmate all about his plan just before he was released on the 1st of July 2010. A few hours later, he updated his Facebook status to say, Just out of jail, I've lost everything. My business, my property, and to top it all off, my lass has gone off with someone else. Watch and see what happens. At around one in the morning on Saturday, the 3rd of July, Moat paid a visit to Samantha's house, where Moat claimed to have listened to her and Brown laughing about him through an open window. It seems the couple eventually spotted Moat lurking around outside because at 20 to 3, Brown came out of the house to confront Moat. So, Moat responded in a calm, reasonable and rational manner. He shot Brown dead with a sawn-off shotgun. Samantha's mother, who was also in the house, immediately went to call the police, but Samantha herself was seriously wounded by two shots that Moat fired through the living room window, which hit her in the arm and abdomen. Twelve hours later, the police announced that they were looking for Raoul Moat, as details started to emerge about the nature of his relationship with Samantha and Brown. But they didn't have to wait long to receive new information about his whereabouts. 
that very same night, Moat was actually kind enough to give the cops a heads up about what he was up to. He dialed 999 and he told the cops that he intended to go on a rampage. But unlike most mass shooters, Moat's only target was going to be police officers. He said that he was going to kill any cop that crossed his path. What the matter is, I'm not coming in alive. You have hassled me for so many years. Hey, come anywhere near me and I'll kill you. I've got two hostages at the minute, right? Come anywhere near me and I'll kill them as well. I'm coming to get you. I'm not on the run. I am coming to get you. And unfortunately, it didn't take long for him to find a target. 12 minutes after making this phone call, Raul Moat shot a traffic officer named PC David Rathbund in the face while he sat in his car near a roundabout in East Denton, when his shift was just about to end. Fortunately, Rathbund survived the attack after being rushed to hospital in critical condition, but he was now permanently blinded. It was later found out that Rathbund and Moat had actually encountered each other before when Rathbund impounded Moat's van. But their second meeting turned out to just be a tragic coincidence, because true to his word, Moat had just spotted a random police car and just started shooting. After shooting PC Rathbund, Moat called the police again and told them what he'd just done. The cops then tried to get him to turn himself in for the sake of his daughter and for the sake of his two other children from previous relationships, but to no avail. And what came next was essentially a declaration of war on the police. The cops received a rambling 49-page letter that made Moat's motivation for the shooting spree abundantly clear. He fully believed that the police had taken his children, freedom and girlfriend away because they were out to get him. Moat genuinely thought that the cops had gone right out of their way and concocted this huge Machiavellian scheme to cuck him out of spite. It seemed that Raoul Moat was still completely unaware that Chris Brown was never actually a cop in the first place. But despite being way past the point of respectability, Moat still seemed to care about how people saw him because he made an attempt at showing restraint by saying, and I quote, the public need not fear me, but the police should, as I won't stop until I'm dead. Which was true since Raoul Moat didn't actually hurt members of the public during his rampage. He at one point did threaten to, but he never actually did it. And so began the biggest manhunt that Britain had seen in over four decades as the cops tried to track Moat's movements across the Newcastle area. And Raoul Moat himself instantly became a media sensation because the public are a bit weird like that. I don't know if some of you Zoomers might be a little bit too young to remember this, but Raoul Moat was fucking everywhere on the news. Seriously, I remember when all of this was going down and you could not turn on the TV or open a newspaper without seeing his face. People just couldn't get enough of the updates on his whereabouts and speculating on where he'd pop up next. In addition to TV just being more convenient, everyone watched the shit show from a distance because the public were obviously warned not to approach Moat if they ever saw him. However, the cops were also told to stay away from him because of his severe prejudice towards them. And Moat was very diligent about reminding the cops of his grudge because he kept using payphones and Facebook to threaten to kill them if they ever tried to stop him, making it abundantly clear that he would die before going back to prison. Another thing that I feel should definitely be pointed out in these circumstances... Have you ever tried to call the cops for anything? Even if it's something serious and they just clearly do not give a shit. They'll write it down in their little book and vanish off into the night and that's the last you'll ever hear from them. Unless it was over offensive tweets or something, but I digress. Well, that's been the state of modern policing for quite a while now. 
But when the Rayo Moat stuff kicked off, <laughs> the police pulled out all of the stops. They were pulling in reinforcements from everywhere. They were pulling in people from Northern Ireland. They even had every intelligence agency in Britain involved in the investigation. And I just think it's very important to point out that one of the few times that the police actually went right overboard in trying to catch a bad guy is because that bad guy was targeting the police. I just think it's very important to point that out. After a weekend of playing cat and mouse with Raoul Moat, the cops brought in reinforcements. On Monday the 5th of July, firearms officers were rolled out from Cleveland, Humberside, West and South Yorkshire and Cumbria to hunt Moat down. The manhunt was at such a scale that the cops really brought out the big guns. Well, Maybe not big by the standards of literally any other free country, but it's Britain, they had to work with what they had. 160 armed officers, helicopters, armoured vehicles, you name it, were all brought in for this one man. But while police managed to muster up such an impressive response to one single guy, it's weird that they were completely useless in preventing the whole affair in the first place. As, with every fucking shooting scenario these days, it turned out that Moat was already on the police's radar. Durham Prison had actually warned them as early as Friday that Moat might go after Samantha because while Moat was in prison, he said some shit. He said some rather concerning things regarding Samantha and his plans for her. But instead of doing anything about it, they just sat in their arses and did fuck all. So, like I said before, they only started to care when they became the target. But on the bright side, Samantha had been saved by emergency surgery and she was no longer in critical condition. So she started trying to get Moat to turn himself in by saying things like, if you still loved me and our baby, you would not be doing this. Over the subsequent days, as the British public waited with bated breath for the next Moat sighting, the cops found a number of campsites where Moat had slept. After searching one of these sites, they found a voice recorder in a tent, which contained four hours of Moat's ramblings about his situation, especially over how he was being portrayed in the media. It turned out that Raoul Moat was so convinced that the police had developed this massive Machiavellian scheme just to get him, that he genuinely believed that the police were manipulating the media coverage on purpose, as if this whole entire thing was engineered as a false flag operation to goad Moat into going on a week-long murderous rampage to turn public opinion against himself. But yeah, Moat was paying attention to the media, and he was getting increasingly pissed off with it, which really wasn't helped by the fact that his own mother, who he hadn't even seen in 18 years, said that he would be better off dead in an interview. The reporting of the monstrous shit that Moat had done, including in his past, had bruised Moat's ego so badly that he responded by threatening to kill a member of the public for every perceived inaccuracy that gets published about him. Except for old ladies. Every man's got a line, I guess. The police then responded to Moat's bombshell by requesting a complete media blackout on the advice of psychologists because the media reporting was now putting civilians in Moat's crosshairs. Not that the media would have given a single fuck about that, but anyway, they were also very worried that Moat would start blasting again if he felt like he was being insulted or disrespected. Because if a crisis occurs and journalists don't stir the pot, is it really a crisis? Oh, bingo. On Tuesday the 6th, it seemed like Rao Moat had struck again, as reports came in of an armed robbery that had been committed by someone matching Moat's description. And this robbery was committed at a chippy in a town in Northumberland called Seton Delaval. Later that day, his car was found in the village of Rothbury in Northumberland, which practically slammed into lockdown. Residents were warned to stay inside, roadblocks and a two-mile exclusion zone were set up, and cops were also posted outside of schools to give peace of mind to parents and also just in case. The police also offered a £10,000 reward for any member of the public 
who helped find Raoul Mott. You know that a manhunt is getting good when the perp gets a literal bounty put on their head. A couple of days later, the police made it easier for members of the public to spot Moat by releasing CCTV photos of him that had been taken at a shop in Newcastle the previous Friday, in which he had a mohawk. And it worked. On the evening of the 9th of July, witnesses spotted a man lying on the bank of the River Coquet in Rothbury with a sawn-off shotgun held to his own neck. Moat had finally been found. The riverbank was immediately cordoned off and cops swarmed the area, with snipers nestling themselves in the bedrooms or on the flat roofs of nearby houses. Despite having Moat cornered, the cops still kept a distance of seven metres, not only for their own safety, but also his, because the cops were really intent on bringing him in alive. However, Moat didn't make it easy for them, because for the next six hours, Moat kept pressing his shotgun to his head and neck as the cops desperately tried to negotiate his surrender. The standoff got so drawn out that the cops ended up giving Moat food and water to try and keep him comfortable so that he wouldn't get stressed out and do anything rash. But do you know who did do something rash? I, I have to talk about this, I'm sorry. This was probably one of the dumbest, dumbest fucking moments in, like, British news history. This was so fucking stupid. This was just mind-numbingly, mind-numbingly dumb, right? Despite the fact that the entire area was at DEFCON 1 and the riverbank was absolutely crawling with police over this extremely serious and sensitive situation, none other than the footballer... Paul Gascoigne randomly showed up during the night, drunk and high off his fucking tree, asking the police officers, where's Moti? <laughs> you see, Paul Gascoigne was at home, knocking back a few drinks and hoovering up a few lines, while watching this whole scenario unfolding on TV, as you do. When his drug-addled and alcohol-brutalised mind started to do some thinking. The Yanks will have no idea who Paul Gascoigne is, but everyone from Britain will know that this was pretty typical behaviour for him. Alcoholism seriously ruined that man. But anyway, the situation seemed really tense and had been going on for quite a while, so Moat probably just needed to chill the fuck out and get a good bite to eat. And then, in a stroke of absolute genius, Gascoigne figured out how to kill two birds with one stone. Gascoigne decided to take Raoul fishing. <laughs> he went... He went to take Raoul Mo fishing. It was... It was the middle of an armed fucking standoff in Gaza. <laughs> fucking went down there. It was, it was a perfect plan. He was right there on the riverbank anyway. They wouldn't even have to go anywhere. They could just... They could just fish where the standoff was happening. Paul Gascoigne talked about this event a few years later. And I'm just going to let him explain his thought process himself. Because it really is something. He said, and I quote, You've got to realise I'm half cut anyway. Sitting in the living room. I've got about six lines lined up. I'm not realising much, but a good line and me and Raoul Moat are sort of friends. A couple more lines and we're good buddies. A few whiskies, another few lines, I've had about eight lines now, and we went to school together. He was in Rothbury, that's where I used to go fishing, so I know the area quite well. Another line and I have a couple of fishing rods and a chicken. He's going to need a drink. I've had 14 lines now, and he's my brother. I've got my fishing rods, I've got my barber jacket, I've got my four cans, I've got my chicken. My chicken is important because he must be starving. This, this is probably a good time to bring up a condition known as ARBD. Alcohol-related brain damage. So, go Google what that is if you want an explanation behind all of the garbage I just read out. So, with this inscrutable plan in place, Gaza just rocked up to the police cordon in a taxi, gifts in hand, while wearing a dressing gown. 
Naturally, the cops immediately told him to fuck off and go home, even though he tried to bluff his way past the police cordon by saying, I just want to give him some therapy and say, come on, Moti, it's Gaza. I guarantee, Moti, he won't shoot me. I am good friends with him. Ultimately, however, Gaza soon went home and sobered up. Though, he didn't even realise what he had done until he saw himself on the news the next day and then saw that he had 250 missed calls on his phone which was sitting next to some fishing rods, a jacket and a chicken. This man just rocked up to an armed standoff with a fucking chicken like a coked out Diogenes. Over time, Moat got increasingly agitated and he started rubbing his face and was almost whimpering as the night wore on. At one point, Moat's best friend also tried to talk him down but it didn't seem to work because shortly after this, Moat finally snapped. At around quarter past one in the morning on the 10th of July, Moat finally put the shotgun to his head, said goodnight and gave himself the Cobain special, concluding the manhunt with a literal face off. According to a local witness, Rao Moat's last words were, I have not got a dad, no one cares about me. On the following Tuesday, a coroner determined that Moat did in fact die from a self-inflicted gunshot wound, but he also determined that Moat had been tased twice. As the official story goes, the cops did this to try and stop Moat from killing himself, for some fucking reason, but it's unclear whether the tasers were actually fired before or after Moat pulled the trigger. It turned out that the cops had also used a non-approved taser. Instead of the standard issue taser, the cops had used a fancier pump action taser so that they could hit him from further away. Now, I know I've already checked off incompetent cops on the bingo card, but I really want us to dwell on that for a second. The cops were faced with a suicidal man holding a gun to his head, so they decided to shoot him with tasers to try and stop him from shooting himself. You know, tasers, those things that make your muscles go absolutely haywire and spaz out, like the ones in your trigger finger. The aftermath of the manhunt also saw two accomplices of Moats facing justice after they were arrested on Thursday the 8th of July while Moat himself was still on the run. Carol Ness was actually with Moat when he attacked Chris Brown and Samantha and he got three life sentences with a minimum of 40 years for murder, conspiracy to commit murder and attempted murder. He also got five years for helping Moat actually acquire the firearms that he used during his rampage. The second accomplice, Kurum Awan, drove Moat around while hunting for cops to kill before finding PC Rathbund, which earned him a minimum of 20 years for conspiracy to commit murder and attempted murder. And to top it all off, both guys also got several years for robbery. Also, on the 14th of June, a third accomplice named Scott Reisbeck was sentenced to 15 months for getting rid of the van that Moat used during the Samantha and Brown attack, as well as hiding other pieces of evidence. One thing that also happened throughout the manhunt that I've saved to bring up here was the fact that Moat's family were in the press quite extensively trying to appeal to Moat and get him to turn himself in. And I must say, they did a bang up job, well done. But as the dust settled, Moat's family finally talked about how tragic the whole affair was. For Moat. They kept going on about how gentle, loving and troubled Moat was. How he just needed some help and saying that if the cops had allowed them to try and talk to him on the riverbank, then Moat might still be alive. And sure, one could argue that Moat was in a very bad mental state that led him to do some really bad things, and that a bit of kindness from someone that cared about him might have been enough to get him to stand down from the riverbank. That's very nice. However, I have a counter-argument. Fuck off. Where the hell were all of them before Moat went on a murderous rampage? And you will never guess who one of the family members was. Moat's dad 
Moat's fucking dad came out of the woodwork after leaving to get milk all of those years ago and joined the chorus of voices asking Moat to stop. Of course, he made a video appeal to try and convince Moat to turn himself in, and he went on in the press about his regret about everything and told everyone how sorry he was, but, you know, only 37 years too late. If he cared so much, then where the fuck was he for all of Moat's life? Maybe if he pulled his fingers out and actually been there for his son while he was growing up, none of this would have even happened, which can be said about a lot of fatherless people. As egregious as it is, I suppose it's to be expected that Moat's family tried to rationalise what he did to try and scrape together some sympathy. But what's really weird is that a lot of other people kept running defence for him, which wasn't helped by how the media reported on the manhunt. The way they talked about Moat's motivations, his hulking physique and his notoriety as a hard man came across as sympathetic to a lot of people. After Moat had died, a Facebook page titled R.I.P. Raul Moat, You Legend was... <laughs> oh, look, I'm sorry, that is a little bit funny. Uh, ...was created and garnered around 35,000 followers and even more detractors. Police aren't very popular in the UK. Even though Facebook declined to take the group down for free speech reasons, God, remember when things were better? The creator of the page decided to take it down herself after a massive backlash occurred for obvious reasons. And yes, I did say herself because of course it's a fucking woman simping for a murderer. After taking the page down, she made a statement that ran completely counter to what the name of the page suggested. She said, and I quote, We don't condone what he did, as what he did was wrong. I feel sorry for the families, but he was still a human being at the end of the day. He also had problems and he needed help, and he didn't get any help. She also said, To be honest, I didn't think this would be the kind of reaction I would get. I mean, what the fuck did you think was going to happen? The page the page was called R.I.P. Raul Mote, you legend. Like, was this your first ever time on the internet? P.C. Rathbund, the policeman that Mote had blinded, was widely lauded for his bravery in the aftermath of the shooting. He won the Emergency Services section of the Pride of Britain Awards for the courage with which he handled his recovery, during which he was fitted with prosthetic eyes. While he could no longer serve as a police officer, he managed to serve his community by doing a lot of charity work, which included setting up the Blue Lamp Foundation to support emergency service members that are injured in the line of duty, and he even ran in the 2011 London Marathon. Despite his recovery going very well and successfully switching gears in a very meaningful and productive way, since he was now completely blind, Rathbund found relearning how to do essentially everything everything that used to come so easily to be very frustrating. He reportedly didn't believe that he was adjusting to his condition as well as he actually was, despite making really good progress. And being unable to see the faces of his wife and children became too much for Rathbun to bear, which led to him taking his own life in February of 2012 at the age of just 44. Rathbun's passing was followed by an outpouring of condolences from public figures and regular people alike, some of whom left flowers outside of his home. He was scheduled to carry the Olympic torch that year, but his daughter took his place and ran blindfolded in his honour. Sadly, Samantha also considered taking her own life, but thankfully she didn't go through with it and ultimately decided to put the whole thing behind her as much as she could. Despite the physical and psychological scars that she carries, including flashbacks, fear of the dark, and most tragically, survivor's guilt. Nevertheless, Samantha managed to find a new lease on life for the sake of her daughter, and in a way, exorcise Moat's ghost. As she put it herself, if I start putting myself in the position of a victim, then Raoul has won, and I don't want to let him win anymore. It's just a shame that the media and the public gave Moat such a high profile that, in a way, he did sort of win. 
It's pretty fucked that Moat captured the public consciousness so much that he somehow managed to generate a weird fan base, despite having brutally ruined and ended multiple lives. His spectre still looms large enough that just this year, for some reason, ITV released a three-part adaptation of his story titled The Hunt for Raoul Moat. Naturally, it was pretty controversial because for many it was too soon, especially since the series is a dramatisation instead of a documentary. I mean, I get it. I can see the appeal of trying to dissect the psychology of murderers or just rubbernecking at the carnage and antics of the particularly goofy perpetrators. We all love horror movies and the based on a true story hook is an iconic trope for a reason. But the problem with stories of people like Moat is that the actual impact of their crimes always inevitably take a back seat. It's almost impossible to truly keep the victims in the spotlight when the narrative thread holding them all together is the larger than life arsehole that set everything in motion. I mean, I'm even doing it myself right now with this video. After all, it's not Samantha Staubert, Chris Brown or David Rathbun's name in the title of this video, is it? But despite all of this, Raoul Moat has a cult following. And I feel the reason for that cult following is the public perception of the police in Britain is just not great. People don't like cops. Most of the time, they're useless, and the other times where they are actually doing some policing, they're just being annoying assholes and going after you for pedantic little stupid things. The cops aren't seen as protectors, they're more seen as massive annoyances that try to interfere with your lives. They won't do any actual police work unless someone offends you or something. You know, so I think maybe all of that fed into Raoul Moat becoming the British patron saint of fuck the police, even though Chris Brown wasn't even a police officer. Now, I'm definitely not a fan of the police either, but let's not, you know, let's not gun them down in the street. And maybe let's find a better role model than the roided up woman beater. It's Count Dankula on YouTube. Everybody subscribe.